In January of 2020, I received my optic fiber gigabit internet and the ISP provided me with this hideous device which I instantly wanted to get rid of. Unfortunately, or should I say fortunately as you'll shortly discover, my ISP told me there is no way I could not use it. Challenge accepted. This is Fritzbox 5491 and according to my ISP is a high-end device. I mean, in all seriousness, it's actually not a bad one for someone who just needs the basics such as your gigabit links, Wi-Fi, IPTV and even classic telephony. It even has a backdoor, um, sorry, a management protocol called TR069 which the ISP can access the device through without me knowing. The problem I have with this though is the fact that my ISP ISP can have full access to a device in my home and I only get basic and proprietary web interface. Plus, take a good look at it. I mean, it's hideous and I will not have a piece of ugly networking gear in my home, period. How do I know the ISP considers it a high-end device? Well, because after the technician that set it up left, I immediately called support asking if I could get something better and they explained that since I'm a business customer, this is something better. Okay then, as I had absolutely no experience with fiber networking prior to receiving this ugly thing, I of course had to examine it more thoroughly and immediately discovered it comes with an SFP module. Great, I thought to myself, I'll take this SFP module and plug it into my Unify switch which also had two SFP jacks. Although the support told me I shouldn't. Yeah, I guess I do have issues with authority, which is why I tried it anyway. And as you can probably guess by now, it didn't work, otherwise I wouldn't be making this video. And the fact that it didn't work bothered me to no end, solely because I didn't know why it didn't work. Or to put it differently, why it does work or it did work when I put the SFP module into the router. So the first course of action was to try and get root access somehow. I already knew my ISP will not let me do it, so I started googling the name of the device along with your typical phrases such as root access and SSH. Fun fact, Fritzbox, which is the brand of routers manufactured by a German company called AVM, is quite popular in Germany, so there's this IP phone forum where German fellow nerds discuss all sorts of things, fiber optic routers included. There is a downside though, for me at least, it's all in German, which I do not speak, so I had to browse those forums through Google Translate. This took a lot of time, but at that point there were lockdowns all over the place, so time was something I did have. The only downside was that while I was experiencing with the router, the internet wouldn't work, so I was only allowed to do it after the rest of the family was in bed, which meant after midnight. After a couple of weeks of searching the forum and getting nowhere, I decided I'll turn the thing around and ask directly, again using Google Translate. To my surprise, people replied that it is indeed possible to get root access to the device and pointed me to a particular GitHub repository with full instructions. Instructions. I'll leave the link in the description down below. Here's how it works. You download the code from the repo and generate a USB drive which you then stick into the router that is disconnected from power. Because the device needs to be somehow recoverable or accessible if it gets completely bricked, it has the following behavior built in. While it's booting up, if it detects a certain directory structure on the USB drive, it will execute the code inside that drive before it starts its own operating system. Much like you can boot from a USB drive on your PC. And in my case, the code on the drive basically turned on SSH daemon and created a root user with full SSH access. I know what you might be thinking at this point, is that safe? For me, yes, I was both a developer and a systems administrator in my past careers, so I know my way around both code and shell environments. So after I've set up the USB drive, I turned on the router, gave it a minute, then tried accessing the shell and succeeded at nothing. Why? Well, because I took a good look around the file structure and the processes that were running on the device and even found a watchdog program that talks to the SFP module, but unfortunately that program was a compiled binary, so I couldn't do anything with it. It was a dead end. 
or so I thought. Because after a couple of days of brainstorming my next steps, it finally occurred to me. The watchdog script talks to the SFP module, but how? Well, your good old TCP IP. Turns out that the SFP port in Fritzbox is just a WAN port and when logged into its web interface I quickly discovered it even has its own IP which in my case was 192.168.47.1 And that's not even the best part. This web interface, uh, Fritzbox I think it's called, even has a packet capture utility. And I hope you see now where this is going. I unplugged everything from the router including the SFP module except for my PC obviously. Next. I started the capture utility on the WAN port, inserted the SFP module and gave it about 20 seconds or so. Then I stopped the capture utility and downloaded the generated file to my PC. These files are called PCAP files and one of the most popular utilities to open and analyze them is called Wireshark. And one line caught my eye immediately because it had my router's serial number in the payload and it went from 192.168.47.1 to 192.168.47.2 on port 8888. The 47.2 was the IP on the SFP module, which I think was my biggest point of learning at the time. The SFP module has its own IP, meaning it has its own interface on its own operating system. This tiny device has a Linux software on chip. And the second realization, my ISP uses the serial number, which can be found on the bottom of the device by the way, for authorization of the router into its network. And the SFP module that it comes with doesn't have that serial baked in, but instead receives it from the watchdog script we mentioned earlier. I probably don't even need to mention I spent countless hours trying to talk to the SFP module without much success at first. Until a couple of weeks later when I got the idea that maybe I could just replicate the payload that the router is sending over bit by bit. So using Wireshark I exported the line in question from the initial packet capture, cleaned it up and when I say cleaned it up I removed the unnecessary headers, then moved this SFP module to my switch and ran the command with the extracted payload from my PC and got online. Now, I wouldn't hold this very same SFP module in my hands while talking to you if this was the end of the story, would I? You see, even with it being in my switch, I still had to worry that it properly received the serial number on each reboot, so I started looking at other SFP GPON modules. Knowing nothing about them at the time, but enough about physics, all I cared about was their wavelength and power. The latter is obviously very important as I didn't want to damage any of the service provider's equipment on the other side of the optic cable. I ordered as many standalone SFP modules I could find, probably around 7 in total, but none of them worked properly. This one for example from an indie GPON developer got online but the IPTV didn't work. The ones from Ubiquiti called UF Instant actually come with solder points on the PCB inside so I was actually able to solder a UART in interface on it, but they run a proprietary firmware that unfortunately only works with their switches, on the optic side that is, so these were a no-go as well. But eventually, I did find the one. This is the Fiberstore.com GPON ONU stick with Mac SFP optical transceiver and has been a part of my network stack for about two years now. And I guess it's the only SFP GPON module on the market that satisfies all the requirements or put it differently is a perfect replacement for the one that came with the Fritz box. It has the same wavelengths, it has the same transmit and receive power and more importantly I can SSH into it and permanently save the serial number into its flash storage and this means the power outages don't have any effect on it and it just continues to work when the power is back on. You can find it on fs.com and I'll leave the link in the description below. The only drawback, it's somewhat expensive for what it is coming at around 70 euros. But given I have likely spent hundreds of hours trying to get to this point, I wasn't going to let that stop me. All right, let's wrap this one for now. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to ask below. And if you enjoyed the video, consider subscribing for more content like this. Tomasz from Slovenia, signing out. <laughs>